We've all heard stories of 20 and 30 year old kids who can't afford to buy a house and even can't afford rent and are moving back in with their parents. This isn't happening because young people have suddenly gotten lazy. Monthly mortgage payments for home buyers are up 20% just in the last year, and that's because interest rates have doubled. Meanwhile, the cost of the average home has gone from $250,000 to $400,000 just since 2019. And those higher home prices have also driven up the cost of rent. So now Americans are paying a third of their income for rent. That's the highest ratio since records were kept. So what's happening? Well, what's happening is BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard, these giant corporations which own 88% of the S&P 500, are going into real estate. These investment firms swoop in as soon as a house comes on the market. They outbid prospective home buyers with cash offers, they add that property to their investment portfolio, and then they rent it back to you or your children at the most exorbitant rate that the market can bear. So how can our kids or the typical American homeowner win a bidding war with BlackRock? By 2030, these giant corporations are on track to own 60% of the single family homes in our country. So BlackRock wants to be everybody's landlord and everybody's neighbor, but I'm not gonna let that happen. When I get to the White House, I'm gonna restore affordable home ownership to every American, and I'm gonna do that without raising the national debt. And here's how I'm gonna accomplish that feat. I'm gonna create a federal program that backs mortgages at 3% financed by tax-free bonds. These these mortgages are going to be available to people only, not corporations. This will drop mortgage payments by more than $1,000 a month for a medium-priced home and allow your children to outcompete BlackRock in the market. So here's how it works. Imagine that you had a rich uncle who was willing to co-sign your mortgage. Well, I'm going to make Uncle Sam that rich uncle. It's not a giveaway, it's a loan guarantee that makes that property affordable to millions of Americans who cannot now afford it. This is just one of the policies that the Kennedy administration will deploy to create millions of new home buying opportunities at payments of less than $1,000 a month. We're also going to change the tax code to get corporations out of the single family home market. And we're going to work with municipalities to get empty lots and derelict homes back into circulation at low prices. As President of the United States, I'm going to create a housing boom in this country the same way that we did it after World War II when we made home ownership affordable for working people people. If you like this video and you want to help me become president of the United States, go to Kennedy24.com and donate now. Joe Biden is in no position and in no condition to take on Bobby Kennedy. He's at the prime of, I don't agree with him, but he's at the prime of his career. I've debated him before at the new school in New York. And you know what? I'll be honest. He crushed me on yeah. environmental issues. He's quite good. Given a, what, 17% polling rate from Robert F. Kennedy, given 69% of Democrats consider the president perhaps too old, given a lot of other factors, should the Democratic National Committee endorse at least one primary debate or no way? No way. This one's an easy question. I believe Bobby Kennedy is going to get somewhere between 30 and 40% of the Democratic vote in New Hampshire. And that'll be an embarrassment for President Biden. But better for Kennedy to do that well than for Joe Biden to risk having a bad debate performance. And quite frankly, as we get into the end of 2023 and Republicans begin to have their debates and their caucuses and primaries, I still wonder why the Democrats don't turn to the president and say to him, sir, the economy is getting a little bit better. Inflation seems to be coming down. This is a great time to pass the torch to the next generation. We're not electing Joe Biden at the age of 80, 81, 82. We're electing him for four years. At 86, do you really yeah. believe, five and a half years from now, that he'll be effective? One of the problems with our democracy, and one of the problems was the repeal of the Fairness Doctrine. And I'd like you to explain what that is. And the reason I'm asking you is because that single act led to the propagation of information and media that no longer is about the truth. It's about polarization. And that was a very disturbing moment in American history that I don't think people, most people caught. Uh, Congress passed it in 1928 at the dawn of commercial radio to make sure there was a diversity of voices. Fairness Doctrine said you could only own a limited number of radio stations because they didn't want more. 
one corporate conglomerate to be able to control the narrative. It was recognized that the public owned the airwaves and that the broadcasters could be licensed to use them, but they, they could only use them to serve the public interest. And what that meant is, yes, they could make money by selling entertainment to you on the radio, but they had to tell the news that was important for forming government policies, at least for a certain amount of minutes or hours per day. And particularly when the television came along, they had to do it at a time when most families would be home. So that's why we had the six o'clock news hour, because they thought all Americans are going to be home. The, the news divisions had to be independent. They had to be telling truth. If they told one side of the story, if there were two sides, you had to let the other people tell their side of the story. I was a fairness doctrine. And, that, and that's why during that period, the news divisions were basically semi-autonomous and they were all money losers because the network would put the money in them because that's the only way they could hold on to their license. And then in 1986, Reagan abolished the Fairness Doctrine through FCC policy. So that today, I think there's five companies, maybe now only four, that control all the virtually all the radio stations, television stations in our country, almost all the newspapers, almost all the billboards, and most of the large internet content providers. So you have this huge consolidation where there's five guys who are now telling American what's news, and there's no obligation anymore that they have to tell the truth. The bean counters at NBC are now telling NBC News Division, you got to show a profit. How do you show a profit if you're a news division? Not by having reporters in every country in the world and reporters in every, you know, every agency of government. There used to be reporters when I was a kid. There'd be a reporter at EPA from NBC. There'd be a reporter full-time at the Commerce Department, at the Transportation Department. And they'd be digging through papers all day, uncovering scandals and revealing of the public. That's all gone. And they show a profit, not by telling us news that may be difficult uh, to explain or hear, but rather by, you know, by entertaining us. And then they do a lot of artisan propaganda and corporate propaganda. It's very, very damaging to our democracy, as our founders predicted. If you like this video and you want to help me become president of the United States, go to Kennedy24.com and donate now. The Democratic Party has had this very interesting shift. When my uncle was president, my father was in. The Democratic Party was where the people who were poor and working people were. And today, 70% of the wealth in this country is owned by the Democratic Party and only 30% of the Republican Party. In its top richest counties in this country, nine of the 10 are Democratic counties. So there is this kind of shift in wealth that maybe is one of the reasons that uh, Democrats do not seem to be talking to or for working people anymore. You know, my father used to bring us to Southeast Washington to meet people who were poor. Or he'd take us to the Mississippi Delta or West Virginia uh, to Appalachia or the Indian reservations. And he always said to us, these, these are your people. Um, he said, the people are wealthy, who are the big corporate leaders and titans. They don't need the Kennedys. They have lawyers and they have PR firms and they have lobbyists. And he said, when you grow, grow older, I want you to do something about those people. And um, you know, that's one of the reasons that I'm running. Robert F. Kennedy Jr., thank you very much for that. Thanks, thank you. Appreciate it. If you like this video and you want to help me become president of the United States, go to Kennedy24.com and donate now. I immigrated to this country, and one of the things that really embodies America to me is the ideal of freedom. Hunter Thompson said, freedom is something that dies unless it's used. What does freedom mean to you? To me, freedom does not mean, you know, chaos and it does not mean anarchy. It has to be accompanied by restraint if it's going to live up to its promise and self-restraint. What it means is the capacity for human beings to exercise and to fulfill their creative energies unrestrained as much as possible by government. So this point that Hunter S. Thompson has made is dies unless it's used. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I do agree with that. Thomas Jefferson said that the Tree of Liberty had to be watered with the blood of each generation. And what he meant by that is that we can't live off the laurels of the American Revolution. We had a generation where between 25,000 and 70,000 Americans died. They gave their lives, they gave their livelihoods, they gave their status, they gave their property, and they put it all on the line to give us our Bill of Rights. 
what those Bill of Rights, the moment that we signed them, there were forces within our society that began trying to chip away at them. And that happens in every generation, and it is the obligation of every generation to safeguard and protect those freedoms. If you like this video and you want to help me become President of the United States, go to Kennedy24.com and donate now. Look at what this war is doing. We have pushed Russia into the embrace of China, which is the worst foreign policy outcome imaginable. It is not good for the national security of our country. And we now have Putin's back to the wall. Well, Putin is the world's leading nuclear superpower. We aren't. He's got a thousand more nukes than we do, and their nukes are much better than ours. They can shoot down our nukes. We can't shoot down theirs. You know, we are provoking a, a confrontation that could very easily lead to nuclear Wait, war. Can I ask you to pause here for a second? Yeah. Everything you've said is checkable and rational, yeah. and you're extrapolating out toward the future, which is easy to envision. I don't understand how our policymakers aren't reaching the same conclusions you just reached. Like, they think that war with Russia is where we're going to win? We cannot win this war. Well, of course. So what are they doing? Like, I don't it understand. Would be Putin today, you know, we thought this was going to hurt him. He's more popular than he's ever been. We were going to break him with the sanctions. We did the opposite. We made him more powerful. He's now insulated from the, you know, from the trade and the international banking system. He's now got this great trade agreement with China. He's now engineering the creation of, of BRICS, which has 40 leading nations around the world turning against the U.S. currency as a reserve currency and adopting his petrol currency or the Chinese currency. That is the worst threat to the United States. That will plan if we lose that status as the world's reserve currency, the Great Depression will look like a cakewalk. So I agree with all of that and, and all of it. I mean, your position to my ears sounds moderate and obvious. I just don't understand how the Secretary of State, how, how the president, how is it his competent advisors can't have reached the same conclusions. Like, what are they thinking? President Biden has always been a very pro-war president. I mean, the only way I can explain it, and I'm not, you know, I don't like to put look in other people's heads, but Biden has always been a reliable, you know, gung-ho, let's go to war guy. It's consistent with his historical instincts. If you like this video and you want to help me become president of the United States, go to Kennedy24.com and donate now. Perhaps the major element that's missing in today's politics is a phenomenon that's never talked about. It's called social cohesion. The erosion of social cohesion is upstream of almost every single problem. What is that? The bonds between people. And social cohesion erosion is like one of the top threats to humanity, right? And nobody's talking about it. Everybody's talking about the environment, nuclear war, and pollution and all that stuff. But we ain't talking about the breakdown of the bonds between people. There's a way in which you could talk about your political adversaries that turns them into your mortal enemies. And our politics has the type of tone that historically leads to violence. One of the major things Kennedy has going for him is that his social cohesion is bridging together voting blocks that people didn't think could be bridged together. He has the potential to create this snowballing supermajority that can knock over all the power structures that are in the way of the people getting their needs met, right? Healing the divide means that we take our disagreements and we take a different tone and we put our humanity first and then discuss the issues without attacking a person. That's what it takes to heal the divide and that's the kind of politics that Bobby is creating the atmosphere for. If you like this video and you wanna help me become president of the United States, go to Kennedy24.com and donate now. There is discrimination in this world and slavery and slaughter and starvation. Governments repress their people. Millions are trapped in poverty while the nation grows rich and wealth is lavished on armaments everywhere. These are differing evils, but they are the common works of man. They reflect the imperfection of human justice, the inadequacy of human compassion, our lack of sensibility towards the suffering of our fellows. But we can perhaps remember, even if only for a time, that those who live with us are our brothers, that they share with us the same short moment of life, 
that they seek as we do, nothing but the chance to live out their lives in purpose and happiness, winning what satisfaction and fulfillment they can. Surely this bond of common faith, this bond of common goal, can begin to teach us something. Surely we can learn, at least to look at those around us as fellow men. And surely we can begin to work a little harder to bind up the wounds among us and to become in our own hearts brothers and countrymen once again. The answer is to rely on youth, not a time of life but a state of mind, a temper of the will, a quality of imagination, a predominance of courage over timidity, of the appetite for adventure over the love of ease, Cruelties and obstacles of this swiftly changing planet will not yield to the obsolete dogmas and outward slogans. They cannot be moved by those who cling to a present that is already dying, who prefer the illusion of security to the excitement and danger that come with even the most peaceful progress. It is a revolutionary world we live in, and this generation at home and around the world has had thrust upon it a greater burden of responsibility than any generation that has ever lived. Some believe there is nothing one man or one woman can do against the enormous array of the world's ills. Yet many of the world's great movements of thought and action have flowed from the work of a single man. A young monk began the Protestant Reformation a young general extended an empire from Macedonia to the borders of the earth. A young woman reclaimed the territory of France. And it was a young Italian explorer who discovered the new world. And the 32-year-old Thomas Jefferson who reclaimed that all men are created equal. These men move the world, and so can we all. Few will have the greatness to bend history itself but each of us can work to change a small portion of events. And in the total of all those acts will be written the history of this generation. Each time a man stands up for an ideal, or acts to improve the lot of others, or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. And crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, those ripples build a current that can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. Few are willing to brave the disapproval of their fellows, the censure of their colleagues, the wrath of their society. Moral courage is a rarer commodity than bravery in battle or great intelligence. Yet it is the one essential, vital quality for those who seek to change a world that yields most painfully I believe that in this generation, those with the courage to enter the moral conflict will find themselves with companions in every corner of the globe. For the fortunate among us, there is the temptation to follow the easy and familiar paths of personal ambition and financial success, so grandly spread before those who enjoy the privilege of education. But that is not the road history has marked out for us. Like it or not, we live in times of danger and uncertainty. But they are also more open to the creative energy of men than any other time in history. All of us will ultimately be judged. And as the years pass, we will surely judge ourselves on the effort we have contributed to building a new world society and the extent to which our ideals and goals have shaped that event. Our future may lie beyond our vision, but it is not completely beyond our control. It is the shaping impulse of America that neither fate nor nature, nor the irresistible tides of history, but the work of our own hands, matched to reason and principle, that will determine our destiny. There is pride in that even arrogance, but there is also experience and truth, and any event 
is the only way we can live. That is the way he lived. That is what he leaves us. My brother need not be idealized or enlarged in death beyond what he was in life. To be remembered simply as a good and decent man who saw wrong and tried to right it, saw suffering and tried to heal it, saw war and tried to stop it. Those of us who loved him and who take him to his rest today pray that what he was to us, what he wished for others, will someday come to pass for all the world. As he said many times in many parts of this nation, to those he touched and who sought to touch him, some men see things as they are and say why. I dream things that never were and say why not. Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear. I, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear. That you will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And will, to the best of your ability, and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. And John Fitzgerald Kennedy, 43-year-old former senator from Massachusetts, becomes the 35th president of the United States. The first person born in the 20th century to fill this great office. Vice President Johnson, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Chief Justice, President Eisenhower, Vice President Nixon, President Truman, Reverend Clergy, fellow citizens. We observe today not a victory of party, but a celebration of freedom, symbolizing an end as well as a beginning, signifying renewal as well as change. For I have sworn before you and Almighty God the same solemn oath our forebears prescribed nearly a century and three quarters ago. The world is very different now, for man holds in his mortal hands the power to abolish all forms of human poverty and all forms of human life. And yet the same revolutionary beliefs for which our forebears fought 
are still at issue around the globe. The belief that the rights of man come not from the generosity of the state, but from the hand of God. We dare not forget today that we are the heirs of that first revolution. Let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans born in this century, tempered by war, disciplined by a hard and bitter peace, proud of our ancient heritage, and unwilling to witness or permit the slow undoing of those human rights to which this nation has always been committed and to which we are committed today at home and around the world. Let every nation know, whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty. This much we pledge and more. To those old allies whose cultural and spiritual origins we share, we pledge the loyalty of faithful friends. United, there is little we cannot do in a host of cooperative ventures. Divided, there is little we can do, for we dare not meet a powerful challenge at odds and split asunder. To those new states whom we welcome to the ranks of the free, we pledge our word that one form of colonial control shall not have passed away merely to be replaced by a far more iron tyranny. We shall not always expect to find them supporting our view, but we shall always hope to find them strongly supporting their own freedom and to remember that in the past those who foolishly sought power by riding the back of the tiger, ended up inside. <laughs> to those people in the huts and villages of half the globe, struggling to break the bonds of mass misery, we pledge our best efforts to help them help themselves. For whatever period is required, not because the communists may be doing it, not because we seek their votes, but because it is right. If a free society cannot help the many who are poor, it cannot save the few who are rich. <laughs> to our sister republics south of our border, we offer a special pledge to convert our good words into good deeds, in a new alliance for progress, to assist free men and free governments in casting off the chains of poverty. But this peaceful revolution of hope cannot become the prey of hostile powers. Let all our neighbors know that we shall join with them to oppose aggression or subversion anywhere in the Americas. And let every other power know that this hemisphere intends to remain the master of its own house. <laughs> to that World Assembly of Sovereign States, the United Nations, our last best hope in an age where the instruments of war have far outpaced the instruments of peace, 
we renew our pledge of support to prevent it from becoming merely a forum for invective, to strengthen its shield of the new and the weak, and to enlarge the area in which its writ may run. Finally, to those nations who would make themselves our adversary, we offer not a pledge, but a request that both sides begin anew the quest for peace. Before the dark powers of destruction, unleashed by science, engulf all humanity in planned or accidental self-destruction. We dare not tempt them with weakness, for only when our arms are sufficient beyond doubt can we be certain beyond doubt that they will never be employed. But neither can two great and powerful groups of nations take comfort from our present course, both sides overburdened by the cost of modern weapons, both rightly alarmed by the steady spread of the deadly atom, yet both racing to alter that uncertain balance of terror that stays the hand of mankind's final war. So let us begin anew, remembering on both sides that civility is not a sign of weakness and sincerity is always subject to proof. Let us never negotiate out of fear, but let us never fear to negotiate. Let both sides explore what problems unite us instead of belaboring those problems which divide us. Let both sides for the first time formulate serious and precise proposals for the inspection and control of arms and bring the absolute power to destroy other nations under the absolute control of all nations. Let both sides seek to invoke the wonders of science instead of its terrors. Together, let us explore the stars, conquer the deserts, eradicate disease, tap the ocean depths, and encourage the arts and commerce. Let both sides unite to heed in all corners of the earth the command of Isaiah to undo the heavy burdens and let the oppressed go free. And if a beachhead of cooperation may push back the jungle of suspicion, let both sides join in creating a new endeavor, not a new balance of power, but a new world of law where the strong are just and the weak secure and the peace preserved. All this will not be finished in the first 100 days, nor will it be finished in the first 1,000 days, nor in the life of this administration, nor even perhaps in our lifetime on this planet. But let us begin. In your hands, my fellow citizens, more than mine, will rest the final success or failure of our course. Since this country was founded, each generation of Americans has been summoned to give testimony to its national loyalty. The graves of young Americans who answered the call to service surround the globe. Now the trumpet summons us again, not as a call to bear arms, though arms we need, not as a call to battle, though in battle we are, but a call to bear the burden of a long twilight struggle, year in and year out, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, 
a struggle against the common enemies of man, tyranny, poverty, disease, and war itself. Can we forge against these enemies a grand and global alliance, north and south, east and west, that can assure a more fruitful life for all mankind? Will you join in that historic effort? In the long history of the world, only a few generations have been granted the role of defending freedom in its hour of maximum danger. I do not shrink from this responsibility. I welcome it. I do not believe that any of us would exchange places with any other people or any other generation. The energy, the faith, the devotion which we bring to this endeavor will light our country and all who serve it. And the glow from that fire can truly light the world. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. My fellow citizens of the world, ask not what America will do for you, but what together we can do for the freedom of man. Finally, whether you are citizens of America or citizens of the world, ask of us here the same high standards of strength and sacrifice which we ask of you. With a good conscience, our only sure reward, with history the final judge of our deeds, let us go forth to lead the land we love, asking his blessing and his help, but knowing that here on earth, God's work must truly be our own. Thank you.